Praise the Lord. Amen. Again, I say praise the Lord. Praise Thank the Lord. Right. Um, so, uh, Pastor Paul is in Scranton uh, with Eric, Corin, Ryan, and family. They're families, too. Um, witnessing, preaching, teaching, bringing the truth of God to an area that uh, they're having a Catholic celebration there. They're taking light in the darkness, y'all. Yeah, yeah. They're taking light in the darkness. And there's no doubt that they'll have some reviving, but prayerfully, they will be fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. With so many of them, uh, with one oneness of mind to uh, give the gospel, to minister to souls, to uh, perfect the thinking of the Catholic brothers, and I'm sure that they're going to talk to people who aren't Catholics, too. Yeah. You know, and uh, sometimes it's easier, though, to talk to, you know, a person who's not been in religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they're talking to somebody who's been steeped in religion yeah. their whole lives. And, right. You know, Catholics like to dip babies. <laughs> you know, they like to sprinkle babies and stuff. So, my dad, my dad, speaking, my dad was uh, raised Catholic. So that he went from being a Catholic his whole life to uh, being Baptist, and he used to tell me how hard it was to try to get out some of that stuff out of his head. Yeah, you know, he said he was an altar boy and things like that. And he was, you know, my dad is a very can be a very serious man, and he was very serious about that as far as what it took for him to actually adjust to, yeah. uh, you know, even the Baptists when they're not. They ain't got things right either, but I remember he used to convey that. So let's lift up those people and pray that, you know, the light is actually, the light of Christ is sh shown and shined into their heart. Amen. For if our gospel be hid, it's hid to those who are lost. lost. Right? And surely right. they don't have the same gospel that we do. So having said that, um, I'm thankful to be able to uh, talk to you today, uh, continue to talk to you today about uh, a godly household. And during the first hour, I was talking to women about, not just about, I first talked in general about marriage, and then I addressed the uh, role and responsibility of women in a marriage, and I used plenty of scripture to do that. But just to quickly restate some of that, uh, women are to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord in everything. Now, that might sound like a whole lot it is, mm -hmm. but a man has the same kind of demand placed on him. And I will spend the majority uh, of my time today talking about what the men's role and responsibility is, as I spoke about what a marriage was and a woman's role. This uh, hour I look to speak to men, husbands, future husbands, and children. Talking about a godly household, I've covered marriage, I've covered female wife's role, I even talked about how God, God ordained marriage in the Garden of Eden before the fall. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, first God gave Adam a job first, and then he gave him a wife. <laughs> Amen? Amen? He gave him a job, then he gave him a wife. Okay? Mm -hmm. Think about that, ladies. <laughs> Think about that. But anyway, expand um, on that a little bit more. Well, yeah, it's really <laughs> self-evident. <laughs> a man needs to have a job to support his wife yeah. and his family. And as a matter of fact, I would, you know, I have enough time, which I probably won't. I will be touching on that. That is actually something that's going to be right. Uh, if you guys didn't know, everybody in the body of Christ is commanded to work. Did y'all know that? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Right. We all that's a commandment of God that we work. Matter of fact, it said if one doesn't take care of his own household, he's worse than an infidel. Yeah. Yeah. So praise the Lord. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I'm gonna back up just a little bit just to touch on some things again. I did uh, say that um, in Ephesians 5:25 would be a good place. Ephesians 5:25 says. 
Husbands, and I'm talking about the responsibility and the role of a husband within a home, in a Christian home. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Mm -hmm. Husbands are instructed to love their wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I talked about love being not just a word, but love is an action word. Mm -hmm. It does something. Amen? Amen? And Christ's love took him to the cross. Christ purchased us, the body of Christ, with his own blood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen? Amen? So husbands, we follow that same pattern. Christ is our pattern in Amen. our marriage. It's a love, it's a love that sacrifices and that gives and that places the other person before itself. Amen? Amen. Not a love that sits back and waits for things to happen, but an active love. Paul provides an example of what kind of love he's talking about. Right in verse 25. The same love that drove Christ to sacrifice his life for the body of Christ. Paul is not talking about feelings or, or based on love, based on emotional love, but a sacrificial love that chooses to esteem and to cherish despite what's ever going on in one's circumstances. Mm -hmm. I'm going to love you anyway. Amen. Even if you do not stay, <laughs> you are the one for me, and this is where I want to be. Now, that's a song I'm singing. Y'all may not know that song, but it's one that I know. Amen, but uh, I digress. So, despite what's ever going on in your circumstances, this love is to carry on and carry through. Love in this case is not a feeling. It's an act of your will. This is not the kind of love that one falls out of. Right. Can, fall, can Christ fall out of love with us, his church? No. Absolutely not. That's unheard of. But even if we are unfaithful, he's faithful. Right. Ephesians 5.28 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Bodies. I also, I've already talked about these things at the end of the first message. I also read Romans chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. It says, O no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Do y'all see that? May husbands, love your wife as yourself. And in Romans 13, before it's even given to a husband, before he's even married, if you're being raised in the doctrine, a young man should know I'm supposed to love people as myself. So before you're, this is advice for all those who would be married one day. Before you get married, you learn this principle first. Because this is going to be your life. Mm -hmm. Loving others more than yourself or as yourself. That should be a practice of all of us. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And learning to put others in front of yourself. Matter of fact, as I said in the first message, don't get married if you're not ready. You got to grow up in the things of the Lord. You got to let the Spirit teach you prior to getting married. Otherwise, this, your marriage is just going to be a big old mess. You won't know what to do. She won't know what to do. Y'all won't know what to do. The kids won't know what to do. Right? And then be another statistic. And they love, the world loves talking about us. Oh, 50% of all marriages end in divorce in the Christian household. Yep. Uh -huh. Not that we was educated and doing what we spoke. <laughs> Amen? That's good. So it's for a father and a mother to kind of teach your children 
to love. Teach young men to love. Mm -hmm. To put others before themselves. To have that sacrificial love. That's very important, men and women, to pass on to your children right. as well. Because that particular passage was talking to all of us, not just husbands. Now, as I read that, I saw that husbands are under a double obligation. You're to both love yourself, and you're to love your wife as yourself, and you're supposed to love all men. Right? Mm -hmm. So obviously God has built a Christian man to do something very well to all people. And that's to be loving. Mm -hmm. And not with a wishy-washy love. And I believe our pastor actually believes that's kind of the fulfillment. That's the height to which we all should want to attain to. Yeah. Loving one another. Amen. Yeah. And you know what? In this particular place, I feel that. I feel that. I've met y'all know. Some of y'all know. I went through a, some challenges over the last couple months. I went through some challenges. And you know what? I felt so much love from y'all. Prayer. People calling on me. When I came here, hugged me. It didn't give me a hard time. I was going through some things. Mm -hmm. But y'all love me through it. And I'm so appreciative of that. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying for me and my wife and my home. Thank you for hugging me when I came in here. Thank you for smiling. Thank you for Gary cracking jokes. <laughs> y'all helped me make it. And I'm grateful to y'all for it. I truly, truly am. And uh, so husbands are under an obligation to love. And I'm going to restate this because Paul is telling all husbands to love their wives as their own bodies or as those who represent their own bodies. In other words, even as Christ is the even though the church is the body of Christ, the wives are the bodies of their husband. You get that? Christ is the head of the church, right? Wives, just like he told a man, this is your body now. Wives, you are the body of your husband. You should feel that way. He should make you feel as though you two are one in the same way he takes care of himself, he takes care of you. He looks after you. He cares for you. He lifts you up. He supports you. He comforts you. He gives you warmth. That's our job. That's nourishing. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and read Every time I take my glasses off, everything gets blurred. Just I stop doing it. Old age. <laughs> it's happening slowly, and I hate it. Uh, Ephesians 5.29 says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, mm -hmm. even as the Lord the church now, I want to give you some simple definitions here in a second. But Paul is dealing with the normal attitude of human beings toward themselves. Normally, a human being, uh, normally a human being seeks to preserve himself or herself and provide for their physical and emotional needs. People take care of themselves. I don't know that. But I ask the question. What does nourish mean? I, I, I'm ashamed of this, but I'm, I'm a school teacher, and sometimes I think that I know what something means, and then I look it up, and it doesn't mean what I thought that it meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to look some things up, just so I got it right. Nourisheth. To make fat by feeding. Hence, to feed, to nurse, to bring up to maturity. Husbands, that's your job in your home. Ensure the growth of all the members of your home. That's your job, to make sure that everyone is growing up into Christ. He 
put that on your shoulders, man. It's not for the woman to do it. It's for you to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for you to do it to her, but it's for you to do to the children, as I will point out later. Nourish means to maintain by feeding, to supply the means of support and increase. Doesn't that sound like God who, the, who increased with the increase of God? You're in his stead in your house. That's what you being the hand is the point of, to make sure that they're all, that we're all growing yeah. in accordance to how the Lord would have you to grow. Men, that's your responsibility in your own. And if you think that things are kind of stagnant, there's no spiritual growth, you have nobody to look at except yourself. Yeah. You're right because right. God gave you that job. To cherish. To cherish means to keep warm. Surprise when I saw that. To cherish means to keep warm. Mm -hmm. To cherish with tender love, with tender care, to treat with tenderness and affection, to give warmth, ease, and comfort. Encourage means to promote the development of something, mm -hmm. typically something regarded as good. A teacher's task is to foster learning, right, Sister Ebony? A teacher's task is to foster learning. And some synonyms for cherish are encourage, promote, further, stimulate, advance, forward, cultivate, nur nurture, strengthen, enrich, help, aid, abet, assist, contribute to, support, endorse, champion, speak for, proselytize, sponsor, espouse, uphold, back, boost, give back into, and to facilitate. Mm -hmm. wow. 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 Cherish. Some things, some words that are not what cherish does not mean. Antonyms. Neglect. Suppress. Destroy. Yeah. You ever see yourself doing those things, man? You're truly barking up the wrong tree. You're doing it all wrong. So those are some definitions for nourish and cherish. Now I hope we have a better understanding, man, of what we're supposed to do and not do in our homes. And I said in the last message, I told you, man, and uh, I might say these things to the women, but yours is going to be by a little harder because I'm one, you know, husband. Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. This one sentence verse, this one sentence verse does an excellent job of summarizing the role and responsibility of a husband. Love her and do her good and do no treachery towards her. But again, words, I love them. Didn't really know what bitter meant first. I didn't really know what bitter meant. So I looked it up. Bitter. To produce a bitter taste in one's stomach or mouth. To exasperate. <laughs> I know sometimes I exasperate my wife. I do. And I can, I can giggle about it because I don't know. I don't know what it means for you. But I know I can get on my baby's nerves. You know, sometimes when I'm. What I'm like, I say, you know what, maybe I just need to go on over here mm -hmm. and talk. Because I can tell you I'm, I'm exasperating this one. But, uh, to exasperate, to render angry, to be indignant, to be embittered, irritated, grieve, deal bitterly with. Bitterly, bitter, bitterness is like something sharp, biting. Cruel, severe, a bitter enmity, <clears throat> sharp words, reproach, reproachful, mm -hmm. sarcastic, mm -hmm. sharp to the feeling, piercing, painful, that makes to smart as a cold, bitter, bitter day or bitter blast of cold air, painful to the mind, calamitous, poignant, afflicted, and distressed. Wow. Bitter. If that's theme of your household, if it's like that, Christ can ease it by simply submitting 
one to another and being gentle with one another. God, through Paul, would not say these things if he didn't know that the natural tendency of a husband would be to deal harshly with his wife. And later on, guess what? He addressed the husband again as it pertained to children. And he told him, the husband, do the same thing with your children. Don't be harsh with them, lest they be discouraged. But build them up. Raise them with the love and admonition of the Lord. Which I'll get to. But husbands, you can see love is what Christ wants us to do. And anything opposed to that is going to feel crushing to those who are inside your home. Ephesians 5.33 says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. And wife, and the wife see that she reverences her husband. The central need that a wife has is to be loved and cherished no matter what. The central responsibility that every husband has is to provide that loving headship for his wife, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? I want to look in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. Now, we do know that this is uh, Peter speaking, but we know that all scripture is for our learning. Amen? Amen. We'll glean out what we need. You guys will see it very, very clearly. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 11 says this. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word. Be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and the wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Ladies, did y'all hear that? which is in the sight of God a great price. Wow. That's valuable to God mm -hmm. when a woman has a quiet spirit and meek spirit. That's a great price in the eyes of the Lord. And it's something that future husbands and husbands, you should recognize and thank God for if your wife possesses that. And future husbands, you want to look for a woman who has that characteristic a quiet and peaceable spirit. God said it's a great price. I'm sorry. I digress. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, Ye husbands, dwell with them in knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, I'm sorry, in his lips that, in his lips that they speak evil. No God. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. 
Now I know that was a whole lot, but that had a whole lot of good stuff about your attitude, about your mind, about what comes out of your mouth, about even what you should mind as far as how you look. Obviously, how you look is not important as how you behave and what you do and how you do it. That's the more valuable thing, as he, First Peter points out. In case you hadn't noticed, men and women are very, very different. God set it up that way. Women can be sometimes more emotional, and women, men can be more logic-based, which actually both are needed. Amen. Now, having said that, men, we are to put our wives and our children And wives, knowing that he's putting you first, revere and reverence him. Respect him because he died for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Matter of fact, he's living for you. He's probably busting his behind every day at work listening to somebody who is probably cognitively smaller and <laughs> inferior to him. And he's doing it because he loves you and wants to provide for you and your children. Mm -hmm. And knowing this, we should both husbands and wives, we should have an appreciation for each other in our roles in our home. Mm -hmm. I should appreciate the work that my wife does. She should appreciate the work that I do. And our children should appreciate the work that we do together for them. Mm -hmm. Do you see how it all works together? Yeah. Amen. So husbands, that's it. I'm, not, I'm, done, with, I'm done with you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> Next part. Children. Children. <laughs> children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Colossians 3.20. Obey your parents in all things is once again a command, a command in the imperative mood. It's not suggesting that you do it. It's telling you to do it mm -hmm. for your own good. And trust me, by the time that I'm done, you'll understand why. It's safe mm -hmm. for you. Children are commanded by God to obey their parents. The word obey means to listen, to hearken unto the command and be submissive and to be obedient. Children are supposed to obey their parents in all things because it is well-pleasing unto the Lord. In other words, it pleases God when children obey their parents. So, young people, if you've ever wondered what's for you, what you should be doing, um, how you should be thinking, all of these things God kind of explains. And here today, my aim is kind of to help you see how important your role is uh -huh. and how God is looking at you. Because he did speak directly through you, through the doctrine, through Paul's, you know, epistles. He speaks to young people. How much, didn't Paul make it a point to, to say, uh, I'm talking about not our pastor Paul, apostle Paul. <laughs> didn't he make it a point to talk to Timothy about how he was reared in the Lord? That's right. Didn't Paul name uh, Eunice, right? And uh, Eunice, Lois, 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 Lois. 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 Yeah. He named them and said, Timothy, you was brought up by godly women. Yeah. Right? right? So, young people, God talks to you too. He's not ignoring you and he sees you. And he himself wants to use your parents to raise you according to how he would have you to be raised. And this is thousands of years old. Uh, this information is. It's not new. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Says. I don't know if I have all of it. Maybe. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee 
and thou mayest live long on the earth. Amen. Ephesians 6, 1 points out, in the Lord, for this is right. So therefore, parents, raise them according to, not as your parents raised you, best thing you can do for your kids' parents is to give them this. Amen. Yes, you want to model. Yes, you want to be an example for your kids. But let it come from here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Let it come from here. Mm -hmm. Some kids really don't, their parents work a lot and they really don't even get to see their parents. As a matter of fact, being a school teacher, I saw kids who I see their parents coming and going, but most of the time they're with their aunts and uncles and grandmas and things like that. And uh, I'm fortunate to uh, have had a mom who raised me, but I wish, now in hindsight, I wish she would have gave me more of this. Yeah. yeah. She yeah. did the best that she did the best that she knew how to do. Her and my daddy, they did the best they knew how to do. They loved me with all their heart, but I wish they knew this. So they could have gave it to me earlier, so I might have missed some pitfalls that I walked into. Mm -hmm. yeah. I might have made life just a little bit. No, it ain't no. My life would have been day and night <laughs> if I had had this. But I was so hard headed and stupid. <laughs> and I'm just being honest with you. When I was young, it, I wasn't doing. I wasn't good because of not to be quite honest with you. It's because of the lack of this. Mm -hmm. right. I didn't lack guidance. I lacked godly guidance because they was always telling me how wrong I was and they was right but they didn't have what to give me to fix it yes, sir. you understand what I'm saying yeah. I didn't have the reverence of the Lord mm -hmm. I had the reverence of I don't want to die and I don't want to go to jail <laughs> I'm just being honest that's what they used to threaten me with and they you know like I said they did the best they could but this right here, now I'm seeing in my older age, it's everything. So, honoring your parents in the Lord um, is translated. The word honor here is also can be translated as value. Okay? The word honor means to value something. Okay? So, if you're told to honor your father, that means value what he says to you. If you're told to honor your mother, then that means you need to take value in what they say and why they're saying it. Mm -hmm. they're, say, they're saying it, as I said earlier, to build you up, to feed you, to nourish you, to nurture you in the Lord. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, you may say, young people, well, that's Old Testament. That's not Paul. Paul is going to quote this Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16 says, Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. So, what that means is, God said, kids, do what your parents tell you to do. That's the guidance that God, the Father, who made all things, he wants you to listen to and value what your parents teach you. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that, and this is the reward of that, that thy days may be prolonged, that means extended, and that it may go well with thee in the land which thy Lord thy God giveth thee. So Paul restates the, that Old Testament commands concerning children in this dispensation of grace. Yeah. During the dispensation of grace, children are supposed to obey and honor their parents in what? All things. Yeah. Deuteronomy. Now this might be a little bit scary. Watch this. This is why it's a very serious thing for young people to obey their parents. Listen to what God says about it. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 through 21. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, 
which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother. And that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto him, to them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him unto the elders of the city and into the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, this is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious and he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton, he is a drunkard and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Yeah. Now I wouldn't, no matter what you do, I ain't going to give it to you, stone you. <laughs> Man, I'd rather lock you up in handcuffs and put you oh, in. <laughs> I don't want to see nobody hurt me, but can you see the attitude that God has towards a rebellious son? I mean, for crying out loud, look at Lucifer. Yeah. Look at Satan. That's how far one can go when he doesn't heed his father. Right? Yeah. There's no end to it. So watch and take heed, young people, that you mind your parents, that you honor them by listening to what they have to say, that you take their admonition for whom the father loves, he chastens, he chastens. Notice how seriously under the law God took the issue of child, of children obeying and honoring their father and their mother. Ephesians 6, 1 and 2 says, well, I won't read it all right now. Because in my understanding, there's a difference in these verses. In my relationship to my sons, I'm always going to be their dad, Right? So they should always honor me. And I'll tell you what I think, Ethan, when you get old enough. I'll tell you what I think. But guess what? I'll say you're your own man now. You can listen to me. You can not listen to me. But I raised you the best I knew. And you're going to do what you're going to do. And I pray that you do what the Lord wills for you to do. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So there comes, a man, there comes a time in a man's life, just like us, or Israel being under the law, the law served as tutors and governors, but that's only for a specific time. That's to the appointed time of the father. Fathers and mothers, at some point in your children's lives, you are going to have to give them a little bit more accountability, a little bit more responsibility, and they're going to have you're going to, have to give it to them to have to choose to make the right choices, and it's going to be on their backs if they make the wrong choice, and it'll be to God's glory when they make the right choices. Amen. Amen? Fathers, it's your job to know your children. And to, fathers, it's your job to know your children and determine when they are mature enough in order to make some of their own decisions. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, parents focus on just having obedient children and fail to teach them doctrine, mm -hmm. fail to teach them values, <laughs> fail to teach them and to model the character from, model character from the word of God. Grace is not only to help a marriage function better. Wives submitting to the husbands, husbands loving your wives with sacrificial love. Grace also affects the children in that home. Grace should not only affect our marriage, but also our children. Uh, Colossians 3.21 is an example of that. It says, I won't read it. I'll just get to the point because I'm running out of time already. All right, it's good, so anyway, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Yeah. Now, that word provoke, I know what a provocation is, or at least I thought I did. Well, let's look at the definition. To make angry, to offend, to incense, to enrage. Fathers are instructed not to provoke their children to anger. First, this implies that husbands, and fathers are supposed to offer loving headship for the wife 
and for the children also. Second, fathers will have a tendency to be too hard at times, too harsh at times, too demanding at times. Mm -hmm. And fathers, we are to monitor ourselves as we instruct our children and how we instruct our children. Mm -hmm. We ought not to parent in a way that tears down our children and ruins their self-confidence and turns them off to the things of God. Rather, we need to set an example of God's grace in how we deal with our children. The word discourage means to be disheartened, means to be dispirited, means to be broken in spirit, means to be discouraged, means to be deprived of courage and confidence, depressed in spirit and dejected. Yeah. Now, as a Son, I can tell you that my dad said some things to me. He said some things to me, but he never told me that you wasn't never going to be nothing. I never heard him say that. I never heard him say you won't amount to nothing. I never heard him speak things that would be daggers to my soul and to mess up my future. He never, he never said things like that to me. So fathers, be very gentle with your kids, but give them the discipline they need. Straighten them on up. That might save them. Mm -hmm. But don't say things that have disheartened them, that would crush them. Be careful. Parents, we hold the spirits of our children, we hold the spirits of our children in our hands. Harsh words and criticism have the capacity to break the spirit of our children. And there's a line that needs to be walked very finely between teaching the children to obey and to be respectful and not discouraging them by breaking their spirits. Walk that fine line. Yeah. And fathers, and ye fathers, provoke not your children under wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6.4 mm -hmm. What is wrath? Wrath in this verse means to provoke, to exasperate, to anger. Instead of provoking them to wrath and anger, fathers are to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I'm closing. What is nurture? Much like nourishment. Mm -hmm. The whole training and education of children, which relates to the cultivation of the mind and their morals, and employs for this purpose now your commands and admonitions, now reproof and punishments. It also includes the training and care of the body. Whatever in adults also cultivates the soul, especially by correcting mistakes and curbing passions. Instruction which aims at increasing virtue. So basically speaking, Nurture is the same thing that nourishing is, to building one up, Amen. edifying. That's what nurturing is, building one up. And fathers and mothers, that's your responsibility to do for your children. Do not expect the school system, the government, this country, even the church to build your kids up. And the Lord, it's your job. Pastor Paul can only do so much. Minister Ryan, Minister Eric can only do so much. That's your job, mm -hmm. mothers and fathers, mm -hmm. to build up your kids in the word. Don't put all that on Pastor Paul. He got men to raise of his own, has raised, and a wife, right? That's your job to build your kids up. And the funny thing about it is you have more time with your kids than him anyway. Than anybody. Amen. Admonition is gentle reproof. Consoling, I'm sorry, counseling against the fault. Instruction and duties. Caution and direction. You can find that in uh, Titus chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In church discipline, public or private, reproof to reclaim an offender. That's what admonition is for. That you can reclaim them. Mm -hmm. Therefore, to bring up 
your kids in the nurture of the Lord is to instruct them in righteousness from the word of God. Now, Hebrews 12 and 5 through 11 uh, would have been my next passage. Um, but basically it says, the Lord chastens, and whom, chastens whom he loves. Right? And chastening is an act of love. As a matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 19 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound up, bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 23, 14 and 15 says, Thou shalt beat him with a rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell, my son, if thine heart be wise. My heart shall rejoice even in mine. In Proverbs 29, 15 through 17 says, the rod of reproof, give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases. But the righteousness, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall be, he shall give delight unto your unto thy soul. There's a big difference between abuse and correcting. Mm -hmm. Judge wisely. Yep. Father, we give you praise and thanks for today, Lord God. We honor you for the word, Lord God, and for the instruction that is for our home, Lord God, and for the growth and edification of your body, ultimately, that we all be fashioned unto you, Lord God, that we all grow up in you, having one mind, speaking the same things, thinking the same things and supporting one another in doing so, Lord God. Thank you for all the godly families that are represented here, Lord God. Thank you for our pastor, Lord God. Thank you for the ministers of this church. Thank you for the deacons of this church, Lord God. And thank you for the presbytery. Thank you for the body, Lord God. And we just give you praise and thanks, Lord God, and ask that we be able to be of service one to another, Lord God, and that we would love all men with your love. And it's in Christ's mighty name that we pray and give you thanks this day. Amen. Amen.